Good morning, the Prince George's County Planning Board is now in session. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, after the summer recess. Pursuant to Section 3-305B7 of the annotated of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, we need a motion to go into closed session for purposes of consultation with council. Is so there a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go in the other room. Oh, okay. Okay. Ryan, we're ready. Okay. Um, okay, we need a motion to come out of closed session. So moved. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. So, um, planning board is back in session. Um, as always, uh, we start with those. It, it's been a long time since our last meeting. We um, had the August recess, which was a little bit extended. And um, we want to say welcome back to everyone and to my colleagues here. Um, but as always, we start with those who have passed on in, our, in between our meetings. So since our last meeting was July 25th, we had a number. So I'm going to ask that you um, bear with me as I go through some of these um, passings. And, and we'll have a moment of silence afterwards. First of all, Michael Hughes, which who is the husband or was the husband of Michelle Hughes, our principal planning technician in the Development Review Division. Um, he, he had a career in management with numerous retail businesses. We want to remember him and remember uh, Michelle in our, our thoughts and prayers. Sam Eisenberg, who was the husband of Lisa Eisenberg, Principal Planning Technician in Development Review Division. He was an engineering technician with the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation and a 38-year lifetime member of the North Beach Volunteer Fire Department. Reverend Christine Dorsey, who is the mother of Gertie Johnson in our Commission Health and Benefits and the grandmother of Tanya Johnson in our Department of Finance. Lillian Edward Hawkins, who um, was the mother of our council member at large, Calvin Hawkins. And those services will be tomorrow, um, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, Lorenzo Boyce Ferguson, the father of Shelley Ferguson, who works with government operations and fiscal policy in Prince George's County government, was a former um, legislative aide. Monica Haley Pearson Esquire, um, she had uh, her own law practice, Haley Pearson Law, which focused on family law, elder law, and real estate matters. And she was a um, former long-term um, partner and associate with Knight, Manzi, Nussbaum, and La Placa, and a member of the County Bar Association. William Pete Muller, um, who was a former firefighter who, um, who retired from the Prince George's County Fire Department. Barbara Coroma of Bowie, who was a stabbing victim whose uh, vehicle crashed near Allen Pond Park. Um, the victims of the mass shootings in El Paso, Texas. The victims of the shootings in Dayton, Ohio. Um, 27 injured, nine people died there. 20 pe 22 people died in El Paso, Texas. The, um, the victims of Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting um, July 28th. At least three people died, including a six-year-old boy, more than 12 injured. The victims of shootings from Midland to Odessa, Texas, seven people died, at least 25 others injured. Um, the time is now. I'm going to stop there. But the time is now. Um, victims of Hurricane Dorian, the Category 5 that, um, hurricane that slammed northeastern Bahamas and, and affected so many other areas, the Carolinas, over 44 deaths, and the death toll continues to climb. The victims of the California dive boat fire, and all 34 people sleeping below deck were declared dead. The young victims of hot car deaths. 38 children have died for being left in a hot car in 2019, 18 of which occurred since our last meeting. How do you leave your child in a hot car? I don't know. 38. Toni Morrison, the renowned author and first African-American woman to win a Nobel Prize. She was a graduate of Howard University, and her works of literature included Song of Solomon, The Bluest <coughs> Eye, and Beloved. She won a Pul Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and she was a finalist for the National Book Award. She received the, presi uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012 from President Barack Obama. Um, Valerie Harper, Emmy and Golden Globe winning actress, best known for her role as Rhoda Morgenstern. Um, Joan Johnson, co-founder of Johnson Products Company, one of the nation's largest black-owned companies. She was a pioneer in the black hair care industry, started a company in 1954. 
um, and she helped the, um, with the growth of Soul Train on television. Peter Fonda. Many of you will remember Peter Fonda, an actor known for his roles in Easy, Easy Rider, um, and also the son of Henry Fonda and the brother of actress Jane Fonda. Mike Kittredge, the f uh, founder of Yankee Candle. Um, um, Clara Bryant, the, age 92, named the world's best known female jazz trumpeter. She earned a place in the male-dominated bandstand next to Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, and Charlie Parker, Charlie Bird Parker. Douglas Moore, age 91, former D.C. council member who led the one of the first citizens to protest racial segregation in the South. Um, Robert Mugme, um, age 95, former president of Zimbabwe. John Wesley, age 72, the actor who uh, on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and so many others. And we also want to remember that yesterday, of September the 11th, was the 18th anniversary of the horrific um, terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and elsewhere, um, and, and, and throughout the country. And um, it, it was horrific, and we want to remember all those victims who died on that day and subsequently, and who continue to pass on because of the effects of um, um, the cleanup and the toxic um, chemicals and whatnot. And so, the, and we want to remember those first responders who gave their lives as well. And most recently, I just want to single out one, um, Luis Alvarez, who um, gave his heartfelt pleading to Congress regarding um, extending the Victims Fund, Compensation Fund, and died shortly thereafter. Um, we also want to remember, it, it is 2019, and we want to remember those, at least 350 Africans who were brutally kidnapped, horrifically transferred, uh, brought here to the United States, stopped off in Mexico um, and, and other places, and, and who less than, fewer than half of them arrived here. But it was the, it's the 400th anniversary of those folks who came and landed in Virginia. Um, and we want to, rem we never want to forget those people who were killed, and that was the, the start, although there was, there's evidence that it really started before that, but as far as we know historically, that this, um, you know, it, it, it was a perpetuation, at least, of um, an awful period in the United States history and throughout the world in terms of the, the slave trade. So we will never, ever, ever, ever forget. Now, there are um, many of you or some of you may have suffered a loss of which I am unaware. Um, if so, our hearts go out to each and every one of you. So with that, unless there are any others, with that, may we have a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, on, on the brighter side, it is National Hispanic Heritage Month, commencing on September 15th through October 15th. And the, the theme is <coughs> Hispanic Ameri Americans, a history of serving our nation. And it's going to, we have some wonderful celebrations. Um, I know we have so, somebody, I know we have the brochures right that here. weren't supposed to be out. Can we, but they're for everyone to see, so I don't know. Can you put them out, Michael, so everyone can see? Um, we have a, the commission is hosting a number of activities. The Hispanic Heritage Opening Month reception this Saturday, September 14th, at Prince George's Ballroom. The 37th, 37th annual Hispanic Festival, which is this Sunday, um, from noon to 6 p.m. at Lane Manor Park. That usually generates at least 15,000 people. Um, Hispanic Heritage Celebration on Sunday, uh, uh, um, no, I mean September 15th at Glass Manor Community Center in Oxon Hill. And this, these brochures have lots and lots of um, information for us. And, and I will also say that we have two bu annual budget forums coming up. The first is on uh, Monday, um, not September 16th at Kenilworth Avenue, our Parks and Recreation Administration building in Riverdale. And the second will be at Monday, um, October 7th at Harmony Hall in Fort Washington. And we solicit information from the public um, about what you would like to see included in our um, commission budget. Um, so I guess September, as I said, is Hispanic Heritage Month. It is All American Breakfast Month, Cholesterol Awareness Month, <coughs> um, Ovarian Cancer <laughs> Awareness Month, and Thyroid Cancer Aware Awareness Month. September um, 12th, 17th, 
uh, September 12, 1977, South African anti-apartheid activist um, Steve Biko was killed while in police custody. Awful. September 12, 1846. I'm going to see who the romanticists are in here. Elizabeth Barrett eloped with Robert Browning. What is she known for? What is the... How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Okay. And then... So, and, and September 12, 1953, then U.S. Senator, future U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy married Jacqueline Bouvier. And finally, on September 12, 1958, the United States Supreme Court ordered an all-white school in Little Rock, Arkansas, to integrate. Um, it is a, September 12th is, is National Police Women's Day, and it's National Day of Encouragement. It is, a, the, for the foodies in us, it's National Cheese Month and National Fruit and Veggies Month. Um, and I think I'm going to stop right there. Um, now, finally, I want to say a great big congratulations to Commissioner Will Dorner, who participated in this um, it's, it was an event sponsored by the HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the National Association of Home Builders. It was their inaugural Innovative Housing Showcase, and he participated in the panel. Um, it was the Local Solutions to Housing Challenges panel, and he was, um, did very well, as he always does, mm -hmm. and he, so much so that he received accommodations from those two organizations and from the Chief Executive Officer and from so the Secretary of, of HUD as well. So um, if we can extend a great big congratulations to him. And, and as, as imperative, as important as that is, you know, that is not um, nearly as important as to the uh, partner that he brought with him today. Yes. And you may take a look at the young man in the back row with the little bow tie, <laughs> and that would be Enrique, Enrique Dorner. So, and he's, and he's busy doing his thing. <laughs> so, we're, we're happy to have that. Uh, we also want to say a happy belated birthday to our Associate General Counsel, George Johnson, who um, is not in the room, but when you see him, say happy belated birthday. And to our own Vice Chair, Dorothy yes. Bailey, we want to say happy belated birthday to her. She had a birthday over the holidays. Not today. <laughs> and some people are just only preoccupied with, with cake. So can you join me in saying happy birthday to Vice Chair Bailey, please? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So with that, we have, um, um, I'll go to, I'll proceed with our agenda. We have before us the draft minutes of the planning board meetings of June 27th and July 18th, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Um, the, is there anyone here to oppose the staff's recommendations on items 4A, B, D, and E, or any board member who wishes to discuss these items? Um, move uh, a consideration of records for the items number 4A, 4B, and 4D, and uh, adoption of staff findings. And approval of items on the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Just clarification. Clarification that includes 4E as well, right? Yes. B yeah. through E. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Minus C. Okay. For A, B, D, E. A, B, D, E through E. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Enrique, we need your help up here. See you again So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you. All right, so we're going to take items um, 5, 6, and 7, which are companion cases. Then we're going to go back to item um, uh, 3C, and then we'll go back to, um, oh, and then we have, yeah, and then we'll go back to item, um, yes. if you can come forward and then, and then we go to 3C and then okay See, I didn't know what you I know I know I just okay okay and then we'll go ahead okay and then we'll go to um 3C and then um uh eight and then one meanwhile we have a resolution of appreciation for Dr. Ann Wass who conscientiously served the Prince George's County um 
the citizens of Prince George's County for 25 years as a key me staff member of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, and we have this, res uh, this wonderful resolution for her, an acknowledgement of her mm -hmm. service. Can we have a motion to approve? So so move. Move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, my name is Thomas Burke. I'm with the Urban Design yes, Section. The project before you this morning is items 5, 6, and 7 on the agenda for Austin Hill McDonald's, including a detailed site plan, DSP 18051, a departure from parking and loading standards, DPLS 463, uh, to reduce the number of parking spaces provided, and a departure from design standards, DDS 658, of the landscape plan. Uh, the applicant is seeking approval of these applications to develop the, this 0.836 acre CSC zone property with an addition to the existing eating and drinking establishment and a second drive through lane. Staff recommends that the board incorporates the record from all three cases. The site is located in the southwest portion of Prince George's County, planning area 76B, Council District 8. More specifically, the site is located on the south side of Oxen Hill Road, west of John Hanson Lane in Oxen Hill. To the west of the site is a multi-tenant office building in the CSC zone. To the south, a non-conforming vacant, a single-family detached dwelling. To the uh, east of the site is an eating and drinking establishment in the CSC zone. Uh, Excuse me, the uh, office building is in the CO zone, not CSC, uh, as is the uh, single family uh, detached dwelling. And to the north, across Oxen Hill Road, is a retail center in the CSC zone. <coughs> this aerial photo illustrates the current conditions of the area, showing the existing building and surrounding uses including the adjacent eating and drinking establishment, which is Wendy's restaurant, the Oxen Hill Professional Center, and the vacant non-conforming dwelling. There are no regulated environmental features on this property. The property slopes gently to the south, away from Oxen Hill Road. Access to the site is via the existing entrance on Oxen Hill Road, which is a master plan arterial. <clears throat> this bird's eye view better illustrates the existing conditions on and adjacent to the site. Showing the Wendy's, this is the, this is the property of the vacant single family dwelling and the multi-tenant office building. The applicant has two main proposals with this with this application. One is to add a 1,373 square foot addition to the existing McDonald's restaurant shown here in Brown for additional dining and for an, an expanded drive through operation. The applicant's statement of justification indicates that although nearly 1,400 square feet is being added, the seating provided will increase by only seven seats for a total of 60 seats. The second part of the request is to add the double drive-through, shown here. This will provide a split in the single access lane for parallel order boards, then merge back into a single lane for payment and pickup. This is a typical layout being installed in similar establishments everywhere to increase efficiency and reduce stacking. <clears throat> As part of this proposal, however, the existing parking spaces along the rear of the site are being converted into a drive aisle, resulting in the loss of spaces and the need for a departure. The applicant is seeking a departure from the parking and loading standards for, with 13 fewer spaces than the 55 spaces required. A parking needs study was provided with this application, which concluded that the proposed parking will be sufficient for the site. Staff recommends approval of this request based on the findings on page seven of the staff report. The application is subject to the requirements of the landscape manual. 
the, the landscape plan provided with the DSP contains the required schedules demonstrating conformance with the requirements with the exception of sections 4.2 for landscaping along Oxen Hill Road and 4.7 incompatible uses along the southern, southern boundary line. Alternative compliance AC 19005 was reviewed and the planning director recommends approval of the AC request for the section 4.2 buffer along Oxen Hill Road with conditions, the found findings of which can be, uh, are, are located on page 11 of the staff report. The planning director recommends disapproval of the 4.7 request, determining that the applicant is unable to provide equally effective measures. The applicant therefore filed a departure from design standards DDS 658 for a reduction in the required 40-foot landscape yard width along the southern property line. The applicant is proposing landscape screening and a fence to improve the visual and environmental quality of the site and to reduce the impacts of this incompatible use on the adjacent property. Staff recommends approval of this departure based on the findings beginning on page 11 of your staff report. A section 4.7 buffer for incompatible uses along the west boundary line here, shown here, was found to meet the requirements with a combination of plantings and an opaque fence. However, the applicant is requesting a change to the fence with an open style picket fence, uh, commonly seen as, uh, or known as a wrought iron fence, uh, but, but with aluminum material, along the western boundary. The attorney for the... It is. A, it's an aluminum fence, but it's it's in the it's in the uh, spirit of the wrought iron okay, fence as we you. used to see. Yeah. Uh, the attorney for the applicant will discuss those details, and staff is prepared to respond. <clears throat> the proposed architectural elevations depict a more contemporary franchise look from the traditional natural brick and double mansard roof uh, we've come to know with McDonald's Corporation. This is a common upgrade for the McDonald's franchise and is similar to the architecture for McDonald's restaurants in other parts of the county, including the uh, McDonald's on 301 in Bowie and uh, Silver Hill Road in Suitland. This slide provides a detail on the circulation pattern of the site, including the double drive through in the rear and the associated sign and menu board detail associated with the drive through excuse me. Urban Design staff recommends that the Planning Board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSP 18051 and DPLS 463, a reduction of 13 spaces from the 55 spaces required, DDS 658 for a departure in the design standards for landscaping, all for the Oxen Hill McDonald's, subject to conditions contained in the staff report dated August 28, 2019. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Burke? So we said the DP, DSP, the DPLS, and the DDS. What about the AC? One part of the AC. Yes. I, I apologize. Yes. yes. And, and AC 19005. And with regards to the other one, section 4.7 is a disapproval? So yes, there was the disapproval. The disapproval then um, established the DDS yeah, 658. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairwoman Hewlett and members of the board, uh, Edward Gibbs uh, here today. Can you hear me? So uh, is that the right location for the mic? I, I don't know. I, it doesn't I, seem I, like it should be. I, right I, I could put it up like that, but then you know, Manute Bowl would have to use it. So. <laughs> Put it, How about put, it I, closer, put it closer. How about if I just take it you out? You could have just moved that. it up a little bit. Um, okay. uh, yes, I'm here representing McDonald's this morning and uh, pleased to be doing so. Um, this has been an incredibly difficult case uh, simply because this restaurant was built in 1972 when, when there... I don't, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Green light. Okay. Okay. When there were no... Uh, regulations from a special exception standpoint. We didn't have fast food restaurants. Uh, there was no regulation of these restaurants that were built with a permit. And the, the, the site is constricted by the development that occurred basically to the edges of the parcel. 
uh, back in 1972. Um, I did the special exception for McDonald's when we uh, legitimized the site as a fast food restaurant. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was, but if you look in the, in the back up, you'll see the year. And I can only tell you that uh, I graduated from law school when I was 18. So uh, I'm not as old as you start counting those years. Um, but uh, we, we, have, we have had to get departures from parking and loading. We've had to get the uh, DDS when the AC couldn't be approved. Um, and, and I really have to compliment your staff. You know, Mr. Burke has just been phenomenal to work with. Um, he has been resilient. He's been understanding. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's just down. worked with us all the way. So we, uh, we couldn't really have accomplished this without his assistance. Um, similarly, um, Ms. Hadegian from the adjoining office condominium building uh, is here today. Uh, we have worked very closely with her, and we can't tell the board enough how much we appreciate her understanding and compromise in getting to this point. And, what we're going to end up with is a restaurant which is much better than what we have today. Um, while we are ha have a, it, it, it appears as if this is a rather um, large expansion on the front of this restaurant building, and, and square footage wise it is. But again, we're only adding seven additional seats. McDonald's has really moved to try to expand the dining room area so that people have more space. Uh, they have larger tables so that even a, a, a six top people with uh, with three in their party can can feel comfortable there and not have to feel like they have to move. Uh, and then several of the seats that are located along the western side of the building are being moved to the front uh, into a more formal dining area and, and we're using some of that building space for equipment in the back. So that, that really is what necessitates the rather large square footage. I passed out a um, sheet with some proposed revised conditions. Right. So we have that. I, I want to accept, um, accept your proposed revised conditions into the record as applicants exhibit number one. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so what I'm proposing is um, on so C. Let me, let me make sure I'm cl sure. clear because I'm following you. And um, um, You're in agreement with staff recommendation for the most part? 100%. 100%. Except for a, a couple of little items we have to okay. massage. Okay. So, um, so almost 100%. Okay. Yeah, but well, these these are really very okay. minor issues. Okay. So on uh, 1C, um, there is an existing masonry trash enclosure, which is located in the southeast corner of the site. And it's going to be retained. It's going to be retained. So yes, so, I do. Thank you. So we just wanted to revise that condition to say okay. that we provide a detail on the plan to show that, and I think Mr. Burke is fine. With Mr. So Burke, hold on a second. Mr. Burke, you're okay with that? So staff has had the opportunity to review these these uh, conditions, and we we support. So I just have one question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can can you make? Will it be the same color as the structure itself? Uh, it can be painted to so be the same color as the structure. Like sure. That it, you know that it matches the. Uh, That's the fine. Facade. We'll we'll do that, and if you. If you want a further revision to say uh, add a trash enclosure detail to the plan depicting location and construction materials of the existing trash enclosure, the enclosure shall be of the same color as the building. Okay. Thank you. I think okay, that's, that's a fine. very fair, very fair comment. Okay. Um, on F, uh, when we originally filed the case, we were showing in the extreme northeast corner about three spaces which were going to be allocated exclusively for drive through patrons to pull over and wait for their order if it, if it was a special order. Uh, staff had commented earlier on that maybe that wasn't the greatest idea, so we took that away. So with that being, with that being done, we no longer needed a, a crosswalk across the parking lot because that there is no exclusive uh, parking spaces which, which would be allocated solely for waiting for your, for your item. Um, so I think Mr. Burke is fine with that. And then um, condition J uh, is the fence along the western boundary. We, we are proposing a six foot high um, uh, wrought iron, well it's an aluminum fence that has the appearance of a wrought iron fence along the western boundary. We had originally proposed a six foot high white uh, vinyl site tight fence along both the southern and western property boundaries. 
that fence will stay on the southern property boundary. On the western property boundary, the uh, office condominium, upon reflection by their board, came to the conclusion that uh, they viewed that as a security issue at night for their parking compound, which is somewhat isolated. Uh, while they wanted a fence to prevent people from walking across, possibly parking in their lot and walking across to our restaurant, um, they wanted it to be something that, you, that would be transparent in terms of being able to see through it uh, so that it, we didn't have uh, security and graffiti issues. There, that was another concern. So we proposed the fence that you see the detail for. Um, and so we would like then to delete what was J and replace it with what is G, which says provide a six foot high black aluminum picket fence along the western property boundary. And, and that detail is already on our plan. So I, I don't need to give you an, another okay. example of that. And then the directional signs. Yes, I have. Uh, there are two directional signs today. They are each 92 inches in height. Okay. Uh, we're proposing, uh, and they're basically just a, a an iron stanchion with uh, a welcome arch with a uh, enter, enter arrow and exit arrow. Um, so we're propose, proposing to replace that with a 48 inch high instead of 92 um, entrance sign, one at each driveway. Uh, and, and we'd like to have that approved as uh, condition 1H. So that's 48. It's 48, yeah. Okay, so we'll. You said one, what did you say? Well, here's the problem. If you look at your staff report, uh -huh. the, the, the J jump, we, okay. we, we didn't have, we, the, we, we have the no, we didn't have the other letters. Okay, oh, I see. So, okay. so we deleted okay. J and okay. it became G. Okay, but, uh, so we're going to accept this into the record as um, applicants exhibit 2A and B. That's, uh, that's, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. And uh, one final comment, uh, and we showed this on our revised plans as well. The fence along the western boundary, uh, the office uh, folks had asked us to take it out a little bit further, not past our property boundary, but a little bit further than where we had shown it, just to make it more difficult for anyone to park in their lot and walk around, and we agreed to that as well. We didn't need a condition for that because we showed it on an amended site plan, Just, but I just wanted to mention that. So with that being said, once again, you know, kudos, kudos to your staff for getting this taken care of because it was... It was a walking nightmare, procedurally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam okay. Chair, just want to say yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, the staff has prepared findings uh, for the 1J. We're, we're, we're able to incorporate into the. Uh, they include the deletion of the 1J. Oh, okay. Okay. So is that what? And the approval of a, you know, of a revised AC. So we're going to accept this into the record as staff exhibit number one. Okay, um, we have way too many here, I think. Are there questions of Mr. Gibbs at this moment? You have the opportunity to come back up um, if there are no questions. Okay. So, Ms. Um, how do you pronounce your last name? Sedagian, like Kardashian. Sedagian. Okay, Ms. <laughs> Sedagian. Do you wish to speak? Thank you. Please come forward. A and B, two A and B. Okay. I'm going to have to lower that. Staff, the applicants are sitting. Good morning. My name is Holly Sedagian. Okay. My address is 6130 Oxen Hill Road, um, Suite 301, Oxen Hill, Maryland. As um, Mr. Gibbs and Mr. Burke pointed out, I'm in the, I, I have an office condo in the office building on the western side of the McDonald's. Um, we approached Mr. Burke, our building did certain concerns we had regarding the expansion of the McDonald's next door. Um, Mr. Burke put us in touch with Mr. Gibbs 
and uh, our office condo board and Mr. Gibbs and McDonald's starting uh, work together to address the concerns of our building. I too uh, want to commend Mr. Burke for his very hard work. He was, he was um, always available to us. He did everything possible uh, to uh, make sure all issues were addressed. Um, in addition to that, both Mr. Gibbs and McDonald's bent over backwards to address all of our concerns. Um, we believe all of our concerns have been addressed and we're very excited about the proposed expansion of the McDonald's uh, next to our building. Um, and we think it's going to be a great improvement in an area that needs improvement. It's also been the catalyst knowing that the McDonald's next door to our building is renovating and expanding. Our building is doing the same in terms of making certain exterior upgrades so we can uh, uh, complement our neighbor next door. So um, I'm just here today to let the planning board know of uh, the great work of Mr. Burke as well as how wonderful McDonald's and Mr. Gibbs have been to work with and that uh, our building wholeheartedly wants to give its blessing to the expansion and hopes you do the same. Thank you very much for, for your input today. Thank Are you. there any questions? Thank you. Mr. Gibbs, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, no, nothing more, just okay. to thank Holly. Okay, so was that concludes my sign-up sheet. Was there anyone else who wished to speak? If not, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, I move that we approve uh, adopt the findings of staff as further applied by staff exhibit number one uh, and accept their conditions as further modified by applicants exhibit number one and number two and on uh, applicant exhibit number one on uh, 1C to include the enclosure shall be of the same color as the building and we approve DSP 18051, departure TPLS-463, DTS-658, and alternative compliance AC-19005. And just, to be clear, so just as a clarification on the motion for the approval of the AC-19005, I assume that that is recommending approval of section 4.2, but yes. disapproval of section 4.7. Yes. Correct. Okay. And excuse me. And as amended with the with uh, DDS. With the, right. Oh, actually, with with the uh, open style fence. Open yeah. style fence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank That's you. Incorporated. Okay. Uh, so I'll second my motion. We have a motion and we have a second. And again, the the record of one is has been incorporated to all th all three cases. So um, so it's all been combined. Okay. Um, is there any additional discussion? Um, well, it's good to see that break helped out, so that's a wonderful thing. And um, thank you for the kudos for our, for our wonderful professionals on the team. Thank you. Um, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, so we have to go to, um, before we take item 8, we need to go to 3C. Thank you. Uh, Commissioners, Derek Berlage, Acting Deputy Planning Director, and uh, we're going to give you a short overview this morning of your guidelines for mandatory referral cases involving applications for solar energy systems. Uh, for the public, solar energy systems are often known as solar farms or solar arrays. These are large groups of solar panels that uh, generate electricity to go back into the electricity grid. And it's been about a year and a half since you adopted these guidelines. You've actually reviewed 15 cases at this point. Um, you have another case later on your agenda and another case next week. And so these cases are going to continue to come to you. And we thought it would be useful for you to review your guidelines 
and how um, the prior applications that have come through the board stack up against those guidelines. So that's what we're going to try to do. Um, next, the uh, guidelines were adopted on March 8, 2018. So as I said, about 18 months ago. Next. And there were three reasons why you uh, felt it important to adopt guidelines. The first was the significant and continuing growth in the number of these proposals. The second is that these solar energy systems are exempt from the zoning ordinance by state law, and therefore mandatory referral actually represents the only uh, opportunity for local review of these projects. Also, uh, another state law uh, provides that the Public Service Commission of Maryland, which does have the power to approve or disapprove these projects, is required to give due consideration to local land use policies. And so mandatory referral in your guidelines becomes the county's opportunity um, to provide recommendations to the Public Service Commission about these projects. Next. So your guidelines, which are attached uh, to your packet, cover um, six areas um, that were of great interest to you. And, and I would remind everyone that there was a interagency working group of, of different county agencies led by uh, Ted Kowalik uh, from the Special Projects Section, who um, provided uh, the initial research and, and deliberation to bring you proposed guidelines. And these were the areas that were important to that group, and these were the areas that were important to you. And they were guidelines that would address preferred locations and, and disfavored locations for these facilities, where you want to see them and where you would rather not see them. The issue of woodland conservation, setbacks and height, screening and buffering, rural, scenic, and historic areas, and finally, fencing, lighting, and vegetation. And you'll note on the slide that three of those issue areas are not in bold because those are areas where there really haven't been any issues. Applicants have been more than willing um, mm -hmm. to meet your guidelines in those areas. Uh, the areas that are in bold uh, have been areas where there has been a little more discussion with some of the applicants. And so in the review here, we're going to focus on those, beginning with uh, your guidelines, uh, recommendations for preferred locations. Next. So in your guidelines, you created a uh, priority, a hierarchy, if you will, uh, of locations. And this was your um, effort to essentially uh, inform the solar industry that in Prince George's County, there are certain locations and certain types of land where there is a great deal of uh, support for having these facilities. And there are other types of land, other areas in the county, uh, where the county is less anxious to see these facilities. And so the hope was the solar industry in selecting locations to propose solar energy systems would follow these guidelines. So in order of preference, your highest preference is land that has already been disturbed by development, regardless of what zone it's in. That's most favored because the solar energy systems provide uh, a useful reuse of that property, having it having already been disturbed. Uh, your second priority was industrial and commercial zones. Your third um, priority, and this is really where you're getting into the area where you're less anxious to see these facilities, and that is residential zones other than the three agricultural zones, ROS, OS, and RA. And finally, uh, your least favored or most disfavored um, location for these facilities is property in the ROS, OS, and RA zones because these are zones that are designed to protect open space, to preserve farming in the county, and you were concerned that too many solar energy systems in those locations would compromise the open space and, and agricultural goals of those zones. Next. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what has actually happened? Uh, how do the, the, the projects that have come through this board stack up against your guidelines? So some good news here. Of the 15 cases, nine of them, a majority, actually have been proposed on previously disturbed sites, your highest priority uh, location for SES. So four of them were at public buildings or facilities. Two of them were at closed landfills, an excellent um, opportunity to reuse land that has been significantly disturbed. Uh, two of them were at closed sand and gravel sites, also uh, an excellent location for these type of facilities. And one uh, on a large parking area that was no longer being used. Five of the cases, however, have been on uh, agriculturally zoned land, ROS, 
OSRRA, which is your, your most disfavored location. Uh, but, but five of them have been proposed there and have come through this board. Um, and uh, one of those proposals was withdrawn. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later. It was withdrawn because of its impact on a cultural and historic resource. So five were approved and one was withdrawn. So there were actually six proposals. That's correct. Okay. And of course, in the context of mandatory referral, uh, because, because it's the Public Service Commission that has the power to approve or disapprove, you don't officially approve or disapprove these applications, but you do make recommendations to the Public Service Commission, which can include this site is inappropriate and we would recommend that this location not be used for an SES. Um, the five that were on agricultural land, even though they were in that most disfavored category, uh, your recommendations did not amount to a recommendation to not use the site, but you made strong recommendations about buffering and including pollinator plants, um, plantings, so that even though that land was no longer going to be used for farming, by having pl pollinator plants uh, co-located with the solar facilities, that actually supports the other farmland nearby and the other open space nearby. That was something you may recall was uh, something you consider very important when these facilities were being built on agricultural land. And so in each case, uh, applicants agreed to that, and, and that um, made it more palatable. So just on, on that last part on the dual use, the dual agricultural use on it, one of the sort of pushbacks that we got on on establishing the dual use was that the pollinators were sort of a low intensity, um, low maintenance kind of a of an issue. So you didn't have to actually go out and, and actively mow the the grass or take care of it or anything. Um, since we passed the guidelines or since we sort of approved them, it's come to our attention that there are other low intensity uses that you could have goats or other animals that actually mm -hmm. won't eat the wires, um, and that they could just sort of raise up the panels just slightly more, and you could actually have other agricultural uses. I don't think any of the land that we have we've seen, I could be wrong, but I don't think any of them actually had um, livestock on it, but has there been any consideration of other choices or other sites that might be able to co-locate um, both the, the livestock and the solar? Well, as a matter of fact, your guidelines did address that, um, and um, I'm doing a summary here, but if you look at the guidelines that are attached, the actual guidelines that are attached uh, to this item, um, there's actually a lengthier discussion about mitigation when um, proposals are, are made for agricultural land. And the, the, the recommendation is for dual use, which is to say the land should be used both for solar energy systems and for agriculture. And you list three types of dual use. One of those is livestock. Mm -hmm. The second is to grow crops uh, next to or you know in between the solar panels. Um, and the third is to have pollinator plantings. And all three of those have been suggested to applicants by your staff. Uh, in, in terms of what the applicants have, have done, Pollen. none of them thus far have been open to livestock or actual active crop growth uh, in and around the solar panels. They have all been open to the pollinator planting, plantings, but for whatever reasons have not been, none of the applications you've seen so far have been willing to entertain the other types of dual use. Do we know why? Is it just because they weren't doing the livestock before, or they have a particular company that prefers to have lower... It's less expensive. Like, yeah, just lower height solars. Like, have, have we explored why they haven't had the other options as well? Well, with respect to livestock, uh, they have indicated they're concerned about the safety of the panels and the safety of the livestock. Yeah. Uh, although we know from research that we've done in other parts of the country, mm -hmm. um, that kind of dual use does exist. Yeah, my undergrad has it. So um, my undergrad has active solar panels with sheep around there, and they don't eat the wires or do any of that stuff. But if you recall, when we were deciding that, that was one of the issues, and we did do some research on it, and it was still kind of experimental. Yeah. And I think I now it's a little more safer. doing a priority of the use, and only if it was shown that it could, because, I, you know, the, Especially because it's, you know, our land is so valuable, the agricultural land. I really would like to see maybe strengthening the guidelines to require a little more than just putting pollinators. You just throw out some sunburst plants, and there we are. We satisfied that concern. I think staff can certainly look into into whether there I mean, are opportunities to reinforce that 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 option <clears throat> a little more strongly with applicants. 
Yeah, and I think we've, I, I talked at Manco with some people who already have mm -hmm. those in other counties. They already have animals on some of the solar panels. So I think there's some folks out in the industry that could do it, have some at least minor experience in doing it, and just have, making those recommendations or suggestions would be probably helpful um, to kind of steer them in that direction. And did they already have those animals there? I don't know. Okay. So, that, so I don't know if they were pre-existing or not. The, yeah. Somebody has to care for them. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if they are pre-existing or not. And there's there's other uh, there's other problems with them. You actually have to rotate them around to other land because they do have some wear and tear in the land, and it actually requires a certain grade of the area to actually support it. So there are issues that certain sites just won't support it. Um, but to the extent that we can encourage other options, that'd be that'd be nice to see. I think we, we, like staff can take that into direction to look a little more a little further research on where this is happening and 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 how other projects have been able to accommodate dual use um, and perhaps with that information we can both provide more information to applicants and if it seems appropriate come back to you with options for strengthening your guidelines. Great. That's, that, what that, like. that, that's what I would like. That's what I That's what we're hearing. We'd be happy to uh, pursue that. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Uh, another area where um, there has been a fair amount of discussion with, with some of the applicants is woodland conservation. So your uh, guidelines state that the board strongly discourages the clearing of woodlands for the installation of solar energy systems. And we have thus far had just one case that involved the clearing of woodlands. Next slide, please. Um, which was the Phoenix Solar case uh, on Rollins Avenue in Capitol Heights. And this was a previously disturbed site, but it also had some woodland clearing that the applicant uh, wanted to accomplish. And uh, you did support this, uh, and one reason was that, uh, based on information we received from DPI, the stormwater management of the overall site would actually be improved, irrespective of the solar panels, by clearing that portion of the land for stormwater management. So it was uh, a, a fairly small amount, less than an acre, that was cleared, and there was a sound reason for doing it, and you, that was something you did support. None of the other applications to date have involved clearing of woodland. So that one was because it was an added benefit? That's correct. That was, uh, that was what the staff report indicated, and, and you agreed with that. And next, so finally, the third area where there have been some issues with applicants, rural, scenic, and historic areas. And so uh, your guidelines um, have two uh, sections that address this. The first states that to the maximum extent practical, SES should be sited behind natural topography, existing vegetation, or other landscaping to screen the facility from public view, which, to say, which is to say when an SES is in close proximity uh, to a historic resource, uh, or it, it, it's not necessarily precluding the project, but you would like to make sure both that um, the cultural, the, the, individuals who are visiting or enjoying the cultural resource or the historic resource won't have that experience detracted from by the presence of solar panels. And the way to do that, obviously, is to screen it as effectively as possible. Um, and furthermore, uh, you recommend that the landscape manual, which, like the zoning ordinance, the landscape manual is not binding on these projects because they're exempt from zoning, but uh, your guidelines say that the landscape manual, which has specific guidelines, for scenic and historic designated roads and properties within a historic district and national register properties, um, that those guidelines should be followed by the, by the project. And next. <clears throat> and so it turns out, actually, there have been a fair number of um, projects, um, eight of them, um, that were adjacent to a designated historic road. Uh, so this has been a, a significant issue in terms of wanting to make sure that the buffering was in place. Um, and one of the eight sites, uh, the Monarch site on Old Crane Highway, was also adjacent to a designated historic site. And they, they were adjacent, not, not in the environmental setting. So in seven of these cases, staff recommended um, and the board recommended um, in, its, in its letter to the applicant, uh, screening and landscaping that w in those cases was deemed adequate to protect the historic resource um, from any incompatibility by the uh, creation of the solar energy system next door. Uh, there was one case where the slope of the site made screening essentially impossible. Uh, this was the Boyd Farm case on Croom Road. Croom Road is a scenic and historic road, and it's also 
uh, uh, designated scenic byway at the state level and the national level. And so it's a, it's a resource that is, is, is needing a lot of protection. And the solar project was proposed on an agricultural piece of land that sloped up from Croom Road. And there was essentially no way, even with significant planting, that the solar panels would not be visible from the scenic and historic byway. So you raise serious concerns about that, and the applicant in the end withdrew that case, um, and so it did not move forward. And that uh, concludes our summary of um, how your guidelines have been handled so far. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any more. Are there additional questions at this time? Um, um, Mr. Horn, did you sign up to speak? You signed up to speak on this. Okay. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Arthur Horn, law offices in Largo, Maryland. Um, I uh, <laughs> I'm probably the impetus of why this is here because I represent a client who uh, we were scheduled to go in front of the uh, Planning Board in June. We had to case continue to actually coming up next week. So it's kind of unusual for me to stand here and talk about a case that's not before you because uh, it is coming up next week. But I, You didn't I, want it today, if I recall. No, I didn't want You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I did not want it today. And uh, But these guidelines and stuff uh, is something I just want to talk about in general about, you know, uh, applications and, and the applicants, at least the one we represent, really appreciate the guidelines and understand them. But the guidelines cannot violate the law. And I'm contending on behalf of our client that there are two things that are in your guidelines that are contrary to Maryland Court do, of Appeals. Do you, have, do you actually have a hand out there in front of you? I mean, copy yes. of the guidelines? Okay, so what? what, what well, first of all, well, I'll tell you what it is. First of all, in, in uh, July 2019, the Maryland Court of Appeals. Board of City Commissioners versus Perennial Solar LLC specifically dealt with the issues of solar panel and, lo and location. Local jurisdictions do not get the state where solar panels can be located, period. Well, this, they went into the a whole, violation of the law, though. It, because it's preempted. You're preempted. The, but we can't have, that says we can't have guidelines? No, no, you're not. But your guy, if your guidelines become instead of uh, uh, to discourage becomes prohibited, then it becomes but a we're problem. Not prohibiting it. Well, I, I contend that in the discussions that we're having with staff to staff level, you are, con you are prohibited. We, it, I mean, I, I do contend that. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'll argue that if I come up next week for a specific case. But, so but when we, so let me make sure I'm following you. So if you say, if we recommend a, a denial for, for um, an SES because of our guidelines, they don't comport with our guidelines, and it goes, um, it is, but we don't have the final decision. How are we? You don't have the authority. Your guidelines are based on, if some of your guidelines are covers for based on site location, okay. and no local jurisdiction has the authority to deal with site locations. If I, I mean, okay. the, the case law, it talks about is all those those counties in the eastern shore. They went up to the court and said, "My goodness, we got all this farmland. You're not giving us any opportunity to make rules and regulations re related to the farm." Okay. And 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 court of appeals said that's correct. Said that the general assembly had the opportunity to allow you all to do that. All they say is, "Well, well, you can take into consideration what you what you uh, what your law says, but you don't have any rights to prohibit." The, uh, the location of a solar farm. But correct me if I'm wrong, we don't make approval or disapproval, right? Isn't that ultimately with the state? But your, it is, but your recommendation matters. Your recommendation matters, it, but your recommendation cannot be based on, a denial cannot be based on, uh, well, it doesn't meet our guidelines if your guidelines, part of your guidelines talk about site location. I'd like to see before next week. Could you get us that case? I, I will. I will. You, well, you, you, we're, we're and and they, had, they had a it. tremendous discussion about it. I, do, I remember the case, and, actually. And this past summer at Mako, they were I all remember. down there. The attorney generals, uh, yeah. they all ruled on it. And, you know, everybody on the Eastern Shore everybody was upset about it, but that is the law. I remember the case, and I, I um, but I, 
would like to hear from our own attorneys with regard to the interpretation um, as it pertains to our guidelines. But, but okay. So you're saying, okay, so, so point me to the pages that you're referring okay, so, to. Okay, so, okay, so there's two, there's two things. And I, again, I'm not going to get one, into the specific but okay. thing. But, but that's important because your guidelines are, are, are couched in, well, we, we address preferred, preferred locations okay. and disfavored locations. And then the, then the second thing is what your local zoning ordinance talks about is woodland conservation. Now, if <laughs> your staff is interpreting your guidelines to mean you cannot remove trees to put a solar farm up there. But the reality is, is that we had some, some of the approvals, or at least one of the approvals. Just one. We did go out. I mean, it's, that's not a prohibition. Then. No, but 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 the but the, uh, when I was coming up in front of you all in June, the recommendation was denial because I was removing uh, uh, woodlands, and and that that interpretation is incorrect. If I was if I was doing more than the woodland uh, preservation uh, required, then that'd be one thing. So I, I said to, and I said, well, I say to staff, I said, if I built a house on this property that I own and I cleared it out from my barn, I would not be in violation. But all of a sudden, if I said, well, instead of doing that, I'm less than 50%, I'm, instead of doing that, I'm doing a solar farm, they're saying, well, no, you cannot do it. Because, no, the, because the guidelines say that you cannot clear woodlands for, for, okay, for the purposes so, of... So let me, make, let me ask you this question if, to see if this provides any clarity, at least for me. So are you saying, because these are guidelines, they are not controlling in any way, shape, or form, but are you saying when, it, when, we, make a, the, when we make a recommendation in accordance with our guidelines that the Public, a, public Service Commission attaches a great weight to our recommendation? Is that what you're saying? They attach a weight to it, but also, again, your recommendations can't violate court law, state law, and your own county regulations. So you can't discriminate and say, well, woodland conservation, you treat a homeowner or a farmer or somebody different than you would treat somebody who's putting up a, 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 okay. a solar panel. Okay. And if that's, if that's occurring, then that's an issue. But is that rational basis at all? We need? A, a if we discriminate between the homeowner and, and, a, and a solar panel, we only would need a rational basis to do that? Yes. So if we have a rational basis for doing that, then it's not an issue. Yeah, but, but okay. The rational basis can't be the preservation of trees, which is basically what staff is saying on the woodland conservation. So that that is not the that's, that's not, the not a rational basis. That's not the so so okay so all right, I'm so I'm finished. not so I'm not opposed to you know the, the conditions uh, or the, your guidelines. So you know your so you're but we're just saying your guidelines has to be viewed with a skeptic eye to make sure it's not contrary to state county court law that's all i'm saying okay well you're, we you're saying a whole lot but mm -hmm. okay so my question is so basically you're talking about limiting the locations you know of the, on, on slide five the preferred and disfavored locations and also the woodland um, uh, preservation woodland conservation yes okay, and, and again are, that, and that's okay to say that what well, we prefer you to go in a location but you can't prohibit one from going in another, nor because the whole concept of site location is preempted by the state. But so in our guidelines, in practice, maybe maybe your view is that it's different in terms of what feedback you're getting. But the guidelines themselves that you're talking about, it says the the board sitting preference hierarchy is as follows, listed from the most suitable to least suitable in descending order. So it doesn't say that we prohibit them. It just says that we would. We would prefer them in one place versus another if you if we had the option to actually say here here would be a good place here would be one that's not as good or something, but I don't see anything in the guidelines that actually literally says we prohibit them or we would not allow them in those areas. Okay. And to dovetail on that, you just said that you it's okay to have preferences. Yes, you can let the you can let an uh, applicant know that I, you know we prefer that you located a certain area, but you okay. don't always... Stop, 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 mm -hmm. right there. Okay, if, you, if that's okay, what's wrong with the item, what's wrong with item three and, um, and, and four? 
Nothing. If you're able, if if I come in with an application, I may know that it's in the most disfavored category for the guidelines, but that doesn't mean you can prohibit me from locating well, we can that. We definitely site. prohibit you. We can. That's what I'm trying to. Okay. I'm trying to understand. Okay. Okay. I'm trying. So to. okay. So I think we are. We're all saying the same thing. We're all saying the same thing. So if you know my my statements on this is based on a staff report and having gone through the process and having heard what staff is quoting. The planning board is saying. So maybe, and I'm okay, saying so maybe to you guys, we don't we don't have that maybe in front of us yet. You okay. don't. Okay. But I'm so just saying, in the guidelines, so, I mean, if, if you state that since it's a public hearing, a guidelines is only guidelines is not a prohibition. That's important to state. Well, it is okay. Well, no, it's not because you no. can't. You don't have the authority to prohibit. We know that. Okay. We are saying that all along. We know that. that. So, so, so my my question. And, and this may require a discussion with the planning director um, at some point because if you're saying that that someone on our staff is saying you absolutely cannot do this because it violates our, our it's prohibited, it, you know if they're saying that in another instance, then that's um, not correct because because we, we can't say it. No one can say it can't be done. Well, no, that's, we, that's we why are, I'm here today to okay, make so sure. You, even you, you know, you, you, the staff has so a I right hear, to recommend the right, dollar that's approval true. for you. That's true. But but it can't be based on a guideline that would that is not mandatory. Pro, mandatory. Correct. That's that's okay. true. So we, it's, it seems like we are saying the same thing, but mm -hmm. it also seems like you have the information that we don't have in front of us mm -hmm. right now. So you're protecting your record. Is that's what it sounds well, like? Well, yeah, I, I thought it was important clarity. because I didn't want to come next week and say, oh, well, we had this meeting on the guidelines last week, and I would have to go back and pull this up and say, well, you know, look, did you look at this court of appeals case? Did you hear what the interpretation of the the law is saying about this? As far as site location, so and all. You that's number one, and then number two online. about yeah. the Woodland Conservation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Madam Chair, yes. If I could respond Mr. to Jumea, a couple okay. things, okay. thank you very much. So, for the record, Nicholas Dumay, General Counsel's Office. Um, I, I do want to make two points because I do think, generally speaking, Mr. Horn and the and the commissioners are on the same page as far as what guidelines are and the purpose of these guidelines, which is to inform and make consistent the board's recommendations for purposes of mandatory referral, which is an obligation of the planning board under state law um, for any public project that's being authorized or constructed, including privately owned utilities. Um, I would like to take issue with Mr. Horn's characterization of the perennial solar case. Um, I actually have a couple printouts of the holding of the case, which is frankly concise, easy to understand, and can be summarized in just a sentence or two. Um, which I'm happy to do, but generally speaking, Mr. Horn is at least implying that the planning board essentially should not, in the course of its mandatory referral recommendations, be weighing in on the location or other physical characteristics of these solar sites. And that is categorically, absolutely not what the perennial solar case says. Um, just to take, and this is, there are a large number of quotes you could take from the case to support that view, but okay. in the end it simply says, you know, under the plain language of the statute, meaning the, the public utilities law applicable to solar generating stations, local government is a significant participant in the process and local planning and zoning concerns are important in the PSC approval process. In other words, what you have to say regarding conformance with master plans, with zoning, makes a big difference and is an important part of the statutory scheme that the General Assembly has established. However, the court goes on to say, the ultimate decision maker is the PSC, not local government or local zoning board. So I would submit to Mr. Horn that he, if he has issues with the way in which the PSC is applying the recommendations of the commission through, through its mandatory referral process, he can appeal the decision of the PSC as the final agency decision maker. But I want to ensure that the board is at least uh, understands it has the ability to exercise the full authority that's been granted to it under state law. There are, by the way, several other provisions of state law um, and also local law. I mean, the Prince George's County Code 27294, which mirrors the mandatory referral process, all of which essentially enshrine the commission's advisory recommendations in the in 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 projects like this one. Um, it, you know, and I would also like to very briefly address his comments regarding the Woodland Conservation Ordinance in, in the general sense, not as it relates to any particular project. Um, but I. I go, I, I, okay, let me, let, me, let me stop for a second, then you can come back to Woodland Conservation. Okay, <clears throat> what I am hearing is that we are basically in sync 
with regard to the fact that these are guidelines that are not enforceable, but they are guidelines, and that um, Mr. Warren has no issue with us saying these are our favorite places, and we can do that in descending order down to our least favorite places, um, zones, um, and, and locations. Um, um, so I believe that we have that right, and it sounds like he believes that we have that right. What I, what you said, Mr. DeMay, is that he um, may feel that the, the um, Public Service Commission is attaching too much weight, you know, and that he can take that up there or appeal their decision. But I don't think that's, I asked that question, yeah. and that wasn't the response we got. Um, I, what it also may sound, I, I'm also gleaning that it may, that maybe our staff may be um, um, taking these guidelines too far. I'm not sure because I don't have that. But that, that's, that I did want to address and that. that and that and that saying that, that it, it's, it's absolutely precluded because if, in fact, that's happening and we don't have that in front of us and it's premature for us to discuss that, but if that's happening, we cannot say it's precluded because these, these are guidelines that can, we can say disfavored or favored, mm -hmm. but we cannot say precluded. Um, but what the main thing I think after you talk about um, the woodland conservation is that has, and I don't know whether this has already occurred, but some of this is not appropriate for this point since we're in, in agreement on the, the function of the guidelines. So um, I think this conversation needs to be taken offline to see about the application, to, to discuss the application of these guidelines. Um, and that needs to be with with the applicant, the planning director, legal counsel, and whoever else you need in there. Now, if you want to address the, uh, so that, because I think this is going beyond what we have right that's now. Right. Uh, that, but if you, wanna, if, if you want to talk about um, woodland conservation, that's fine. Just, yeah, just uh, very briefly. Okay, and then and planning director, um, Jacqueline, yes. I, I, I think what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from Mr. Horn is the suggestion that we can't make recommendations based on things that the PSC um, has the ultimate authority on. Well, he, that sounds like something he's saying also. But, but I also, I thought I heard him say that we can't say it's precluded. <clears throat> we don't, we never say But that. I don't know because we don't have that. I don't have that because no, no, he's talking about a matter that's coming before us next week so right. we don't have the staff but, report. But staff is clear that this is, uh, these are okay. recommendations. I got it. Under, got that so it's recommendations, but I do think that this warrants an offline discussion. Right. Absolutely, okay. Madam Chair. I won't be okay. speaking at all about okay. any particular cases okay. or about what staff is doing, but what okay. should happen, in part because Commissioner Giraldo also, uh, you know, responded to Mr. Horn's suggestion that there is some sort of discrimination between uses going on. Uh, Commissioner Giraldo cited an equal protection standard, and again, I, I don't think anybody in this room, at least working for the commission, would, would, would concede that, particularly in the implementation of the Woodland Conservation Ordinance, there's any use discrimination going on. But what I want to make clear to the planning board is the mandatory referral process is a separate and distinct process from, the woodland, from, from application of the Woodland Conservation Ordinance. What we're doing at mandatory referral, what you're doing, is looking at planning, zoning, and general policies within the county, and again, making an advisory recommendation. You have regulatory authority, generally speaking, uh, to implement the Woodland Conservation Ordinance. And as a result, you have a very strict obligation to simply apply the law as it's written. So there's a difference between making a policy recommendation through the mandatory referral content, uh, context uh, or, or process and applying the Woodland Conservation Ordinance in your approval or disapproval of a TCP, for example. So again, I just want to make that clear, that, that it is possible to recommend against a project for purposes of mandatory referral because you don't believe it's consistent with county planning goals, but also ultimately approve a TCP because an, app, you know, an application has been made to the PSC, they've approved it, and you are now sitting as a regulatory body and not an advisory body. So again, you know, how staff implements these, you know, the, the, these, these two roles is, is something certainly appropriate for an offline conversation. But I just want to make clear, there's nothing inconsistent in saying, Planning, good planning policy and the, and the master plans of the county say no to this solar site, but ultimately this solar site does happen to comply with the forest conservation law. Again, you're, you're familiar with essentially wearing multiple hats, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what you're doing here. So, okay, well, thank you for that explanation, but one of the things you just said, um, 
raise an antenna for me. Um, um, are you so? It's sort of like a, a um, akin to when our staff may make a recommendation to the planning board, and we may take a different action. It's something that has to go to the council. So their recommendation to us may have been one thing. The board may make a different decision. And then when our staff goes to, uh, to the district council, they have to share our recommendation. And it sounds to me like you're saying that, or maybe there's a concern or fear that if we make a recommendation as a, a, a policy recommendation against something that goes to, ultimately goes to the, the um, Public Service Commission and they approve it when something comes back to us, for a, for a development proposal that we might try to, for lack of a better word, a technical term, stick it to them. Yeah. Um, and, and, you have, and you have an obligation, Madam Chair, not to Not to, to correct, not right. to. But, but I will point out, staff, staff can uh, recommend to the planning board in the course of mandatory referral that they have, in fact, looked ahead to forest conservation concerns as well, and that there are certain concerns that they anticipate if this ever made it to the TCP process. Now, I'm not saying they should do that in every case, but again, all I'm saying is exactly what you're saying, Madam Chair, is that when you receive a TCP application in the, in the course of your regulatory review, you have an obligation to serve as a quasi-judicial regulatory body. Correct. It's different than your role as an advisory body Correct. under the mandatory referral provision. So. And so, Mr. Horn, is that, I didn't grasp that until, okay. that, that part of it until mm -hmm. uh, Mr. DeMay mentioned it. Is that one of your concerns? Well, yes, it is. I, I don't disagree that you have your own set of rules and regulations for woodland conservation, and I was sort of saying it ahead of time that you, you cannot use your woodland conservation ordinance in, in, a, in, a, in a way to sort of prohibit uh, a development from going forward because your guideline says we discourage the clearing of woodlands for the installation of an SES. You can't do that. And so I don't I don't care, you know, uh, you know, again it's a separate it's a separate issue from what I was talking about the site. And again I respect Mr. Lee, I disagree with his interpretation because I think it's clear that the, the whole of that case says that no local jurisdiction can have control over the siting of the panel, period, the site. But we don't. I know. Okay, but the reason that that's important is the siting of the location is, as far as the guidelines can, 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 can be concerned, you can, someone can use the siting of the panels as the beginning of a justification for saying, we don't think it should be there because, one, you're number four on our list, or you know whatever else so, the case may be. I, my my point is again. That's your concern. That I, that's the part I didn't really hear until Mr. Demay started talking about what our responsibility is. But but it sounds like you have a fear that people will then our staff then use this to circumvent like the, the PSC. And you, these aren't your words. No. But the, I have a justified fear that these policies are being interpreted as prohibited okay. instead of they're guidelines. not prohibited and then I, if we I, need I, to have an my, offline that's conversation the bottom line, yeah. okay they're not we don't they don't prohibit anything they are guidelines mm -hmm. and we have to evaluate everything on a case by case basis in accordance with these guidelines and if you if you, your concerns that warrants a sit down with the parties i just mentioned um, to make and if you have a fear that that something that it might be misused um, or misapplied then that's the conversation that we need to have, and our, our uh, senior management, our planning director, and our legal counsel will ensure that our technical staff will not misapply um, these guidelines. And, and Madam Chair, if I could, one very brief okay. last point of clarification. I, I, I do believe that Mr. Horn is conflating the terms essentially siting and zoning. So what, what the holding of the court says is that this section of the Public Utilities Article preempts by implication local zoning authority for the siting and location of generating stations. That phrase, local zoning authority for the siting and location, is really important because there are a lot of other reasons you can prohibit the siting of a solar facility. For example, doesn't meet stormwater, doesn't meet building code requirements, doesn't meet electrical code requirements, or doesn't meet the, for the woodland conservation ordinance. All this case has to say is that you do not have zoning authority over the siting of these facilities. We all agree on that. So I just want to make that clear okay. when, for, for purposes of future conversations. Okay. So you know what? 
I'm cutting this discussion because we're not going to keep going back and forth on this. We're in agreement that these are guidelines. Y'all can discuss what the case holds offline. You, uh, Mr. Horn, you can express your concerns in a sit-down meeting with our legal counsel and our planning director to ensure that there, there's no misapplication of the guidelines to um, be to cause um, us to be prohibitive down the road. Okay. Do you All right. Like Spark, do you like sheep? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you know, I, I was going to say that, that 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 location of your school, I'm probably sure that they already had animals there. And one of the things that solar farms that we do, it doesn't trigger transportation because nobody has to go out there twice, but if you had animals and stuff there, that would require. So it would take a certain site, probably that's already a farm, yeah, to be able good. to do a solar farm like that. That's why you won't have anybody making a recommendation. If you even if you try to raise your standards, that won't help because if you don't have farm animals there already, or somebody who can take, then that then they're not going to do that because. You know. Yeah, Julie knows. Yeah. Okay. okay. So if they don't do it, then maybe they won't cite it yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So all right. Did I take my aspirin? Okay. Um, um, were, were there any other questions of Mr. Horn? Okay. Was there anyone else who wished to speak on this? Where are you going? I'm just Okay. Um, was there anything else to add, um, um, Mr. Berlage? Do, do you need a, do we need a motion on this or is it just a briefing? No, ma'am, this was just a briefing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then we go to item eight. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Board. My name is Crystal Saunders Hancock, in for um, Christine Osei, the Planner Coordinator um, in, countywide, um, in the Countywide Planning Division. Um, the presentation is on item 8 in today's agenda, um, the mandatory referral application 1908 for Stonemore um, Cemetery Solar Project. This application was continued from June 27th. Staff concerns have been addressed after the applicant did revise the plan concept and staff concerns were addressed regarding tree removal and landscaping adjacent to the existing residential uses. Um, I okay, we did, um, I'd like to introduce a um, letter to the record that was sent yesterday um, to, uh, by Mrs. Cavett, um, and here's a copy of the letter. I have an applicant. I have no one on my sign-up sheet for this. We do have an applicant. Oh, okay. Can, can you, um... I was just getting ready to get to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to make sure that they're signed in. Okay. And, then make, and make sure that they have a copy of the letter, okay? Okay. Okay, so to the letter that we received is um, from IHHAAC Inc., which is the Indian Head Highway Area Action Council Inc., um, which is a federation of South County citizens and civic and neighborhood associations. Um, and it was dated yesterday, September 11th, and it says mandatory referrals for solar energy systems. And it references MR 1908F, Stonemore Cemetery Solar Project. It says, we oppose a portion of this project. We do not believe you or the county residents should have to choose between two environmental goods, 
solar power and tree canopy slash open space. You know space. what? Excuse me. You don't need to read the whole thing. Okay. We have it. Perfect. Okay. Right. Perfect. Great. Thank you. And we're going to accept it into the record as uh, Indian Head Highway Area Action Council um, exhibit number one. Okay. First we have, uh, so uh, right here is an overview of the project. It is located in Council District Number 7. Um, this is an aerial uh, overview of the, of the project area. And this is a project vicinity map of the three uh, areas. Also enclosed are the existing uh, zoning for the property. Um, right. This is Suitland Road uh, in green, which is a um, collector road. Um, here are the natural features of the site. Um, and this is just a project view of the site. Aerial views of the site uh, from Suitland Road, um, the North Array site um, from Suitland Road. Um, the project features. Um, the applicant is proposing an installation of a um, thousand kilowatt to 1400 kilowatt photovoltaic solar rays in the eastern portion of the site. Disturbance um, is of approximately 3.35 acres. Um, the entire sites with the three the entire um, amount of acreage for the three sites is 137.64 acres. Um, the areas of disturbance will result in the following. Installation of 15 rows of 7-foot high round ground-mounted solar arrays um, it would within, uh, be with 8 to 9 feet between rows on the north side of Suitland Road, 25 rows of ground-mounted solar on the south side of Suitland Road, um, it would create uh, two to four foot wide trenches to install electrical cables, um, the concrete equipment and pads and, uh, um, and electrical appurtenances. Uh, um, it's a seven foot wide chain link fence, um, underground electrical conduit, and the site will generate electricity for approximately 25 years in which the panels will be decommissioned. Oh, oh sorry. Um, these are the existing conditions and tree removal. Here's the concept plan <coughs> of the site. Um, these are all of the arrays that are proposed in the area, um, as well as the landscape plan, which it shows the buffering around the, in yellow. I'm sorry, not yellow. This shows the buffering proposed. And this is an apartment complex. Um, this is the design for the racking structures, the construction, what construction could look like, um, the sample panels and equipment. Um, the, su the project is in conformance. Um, the, the subject application, excuse me, is consistent with the 2018 um, Prince George's County Planning Board's uh, Solar Energy Systems Guidelines for mandatory referral cases regarding woodland conservation. Um, this is a uh, we did uh, notify the adjacent property owners. They're all um, outlined in, in this hatching. Um, the notification letters were mailed to the adjoining property owners. Um, as of this date, uh, no issues, uh, except for the one raised by Mrs. Cavett and her group, have been raised. Um, the applicant uh, mailed letters to civic area associations, and the community was, meeting was held on July 24th, 2019. Um, here are the location of existing fire stations um, in the area of the uh, subject property. Um, staff recommends um, that uh, the applicant should provide a minimum of 20 foot wide landscape buffer yard. Um, the applicant should replace um, the Juniperus Fitzeria, uh, sea green with either Tuja Occidentals or Juniperus uh, Virginiana and increase the minimum planting height um, of the evergreen tree to six to eight feet. The applicant should uh, seek approval from the Maryland Department of Transportation and the State Highway Administration to construct an entrance um, from Suitland Road. Um, prior to 
the beginning of construction, the applicant should contact Prince George's County Fire and EMS to work through an emergency, a pre-incident uh, emergency plan. Um, should anything happen, they will know what to do and how to whom to contact. Um, the applicant should also design, install, and maintain a proposed project to meet the minimum standards by the NFPA, um, which is the fire code for solar facilities. Um, and uh, do we have any questions? And we can bring the applicant up, Mr. Ben Levy. I have a question. Oh, sure. Uh, how far is the solar farm from Soup Road itself? Oh, okay. It's right on. Um, it's right on. So it's right on. Yes. And if I'm reading it correctly, there's going to be a chain link fence. Yes. On Suitland Road. Yes. So I seem to recall from several years ago when the Census Bureau was proposing to put up a fence, and our county executive at that time, Wayne Curry, along with uh, oh, five wire fence. Uh huh. But still, it was a chain link fence, and I'm wondering whether or not, I'm not in favor, personally, of a chain link fence on Suitland Road. That's an area they're trying to develop. And you're going to go down Suitland Road and have this gigantic chain link fence. So I would like to know whether or not the applicant can propose something other than the chain link fence. Okay. Well, we'll get the applicant to speak to that. But I want to know, before we go to the applicant, um, I'm going to address the Indian Head Highway area. Action Council letter. Um, 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 it's a, the, the proximity to the metro station, um, and, and also, um, so can you help? I'm sorry. I'm listening. I'm sorry. The, so can you can we can you show us that again? I'm sorry, show you. The, the, I'm, uh, I'm talking about their letter yes. and their proximity to the metro station. Oh. oh. It's, it's off of the map. Okay. We don't... Um, we don't have it on our map. We have it so is this... Is, is this, this are, are we saying... She's saying that this seems to disregard, I'll use her word, the Green Line Station SMA and Sub-4 SMA. Um, I don't know. In what way? I don't know, but that's what the letter says. Mm-hmm. You have the letter, right? Here's the letter. I'm asking. Yeah. I literally just said it. Right here. I think the message is down here Does this run afoul of our approved plans? Mm -hmm. No, we discussed that in the staff report, right? Cemetery. Yeah, it's a cemetery. This is the existing cemetery. Mm -hmm. I know, but... I'm looking for guidance in response to this. Look on page four. Okay. So on, um, um, on page four, we talk about um, the consistency with approved plans. It says the application um, does, not does not conform with sub four, but does conform with the sector plan, the green line. Station. It's a medium residential, yes. And the general plan. Yes. And the general plan. Which designates this um, application and established communities. Okay. The general plan does. Okay. Okay, does, um, um, does anybody else have questions? Okay, is it Mr. Levy? It is, yes. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Benjamin Levy. Okay. Um, my address is 101 Constitution Avenue, Northwest Washington, D.C. Thank you for uh, inviting us here. Madam Chair, um, 
So I can respond to a few of the questions that I, I just heard. Okay. Do you uh, have a copy of the letter from the Indian Head Highway? I have a copy on my um, email. Okay. Do you want to? This will be a little larger. First of all, um, there were a few conditions that were suggested by staff. Um, we understand the overall sentiment of this staff's recommendations is to recommend, but we did want to point out that we plan to uh, comply with all the conditions. Um, there's, I believe there's five of them. Um, second um, to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Geraldo's um, question about the chain link fence. Um, our plan was to install a chain link fence with the, uh, I guess it's black um, paint. However, we believe it will be mostly or entirely obscured by the landscape buffer that will be right in front of it. So as of right now, the plan is to have a landscape buffer that was mentioned um, in, in the presentation that will will be entirely between the fence and the road um, on both sides of the road. So, um, and the recommendation from staff was that uh, the initial plantings are six to eight feet tall and the fence itself will be six. Um, and we've recently um, learned a lot about um, the landscape manual and some of the desires of, uh, of, the, um, of the county um, with respect to obscuring uh, solar panel systems like this. We've just talked about it as well. Um, and uh, we have learned about 15 or 20 indigenous species that we could use um, to ultimately you know, meet the, the needs of the county. Or, um. And in reality, if you look at the, the, the area that we're planning on using, it's three or four acres, but the actual road frontage is you know, I, I don't know what it is offhand, but a couple hundred feet. Mm -hmm. And so that may be a little bit different from um, what the, uh, that other uh, applicant was considering. So you were here earlier, and you heard the, one of the concessions that was made with the McDonald's? And I I'm did. I'm just thinking, aluminum black fence looks a whole lot better than a chain link fence, mm -hmm. especially in this area. And mm -hmm. I'm sensitive to this area because I remember specifically what happened several years ago uh, where we had to get a, a U.S. Senator involved to s make sure that instead of a chain link fence in Suitland that they put up a regular fence. And so I'm sensitive to the, to the neighbors and the community there as well as to having a chain link fence. That sends the wrong message. For what it's worth, I think it would be okay for us to put the uh, the same chain, the same um, faux wrought iron fence up that we had planned on our other project, which I believe is a six foot. Um, I'm not sure if it's vinyl or uh, or aluminum right now. I believe it is aluminum. Sure. That's black, and we can also take a look at what they have there at the. Uh, at the, I, I, I assume you're talking about that federal GSA installation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The so we, yeah. So the, yeah, so we can take a look at that as well. But I, I, I'm comfortable, especially because it's a pretty small amount of linear footage. So you'll agree to, to make that? Uh, uh, along, the, along the Suitland Road mm -hmm. edge, yes. And you also said you're in agreement. So if they're in agreement and, and intend to follow these, we can we can put that in the recommendation depending on the vote that and the applicant has agreed. Yes. And including the fence. Okay. Um, I'm not. Um, let's see. I, I'm not exact, exact exactly sure how to respond to Miss Cavett's comments. Um, okay. Is, is there a specific question? No. On that? No. Okay. All right. I think she was looking for an opportunity for for um, other development there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, just um, putting it into the ether. Yeah, she, I think she. Th their position is this ties the property down for 20, 25 years. years. Yeah. 
Um, but, okay. Okay. And I'd also like to say that, um, you know, this experience here was, uh, was our first working with the board. Um, and obviously the SES systems like we learned today are a, a new and emerging technology and a, a new type of um, uh, use, I suppose, and people across the county are sensitive, and uh, we um, took the, the board's recommendation and we really tried to engage with the community at this project as well as uh, another project that we are um, working on. And we have made great strides to, to, to reach out. Um, we used the, um, the same mailing list uh, that the county is using, which is a wider expanse than the, than the actual direct abutters that we have. Um, and I think that we have made some um, uh, head roads, um, inroads uh, on, um, on our other project. And on this project, we have no... Um, no issues from any of the community members around who we who we spoke they're, to. So because they're not present today, so that tells us something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and this project, as you can see, virtually has doesn't really have very many abutters at all that are residential. Um, so thank you very much for the uh, for the um, for the suggestions and um, and also we we appreciate uh, the staff working with us as this is our first um, experience doing this. So uh, it's, it's, I think we've come a long way since June and since April when we had the very expedited process to, to enter into the mandatory referral uh, meeting, board meeting. Um, are there questions of uh, Mr. Levy? No, I'm just appreciative of the fact that you, you, you were sensitive to the fence issue and that you agreed to make that change. Um, so I'm going to wait and see if there are any other questions before I have a comment. Okay, are there, um, are there any other questions? Was there anyone else who wished to speak? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we would make the recommendation for MR 1908F, the Stone Marsh Cemetery Solar mm -hmm. Project, along with the uh, concessions made by the applicant with regards to the fence on Superman Road. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, Mr. Levy, thank you um, for your comments and um, regarding this emerging area. And also, this is your first foray into Prince George's County. And you said you've come a long way. And thank you for working with the citizens and for embracing the conditions that have been recommended. Um, and it, it's good to hear we, we, we are open for business so long as it's fair and reasonable. and, and um, is complementary with the, the surrounding surrounding developments and, um, and neighborhoods, and seems you seem to have done that. So yeah, good job. Uh, we're glad it's a win-win. And yeah, and also, I was looking at your address on Constitution Ave, which reminded me to say that next um, Tuesday, September seventeenth, is Constitution Day. And uh, uh, sorry, it just you know that's what triggers me. And I wanted to remind everyone that um, actually a whole group of attorneys, uh, myself included, and several of us are going, and, and Mr. Demay and um, our general counsel and so many others are going to, and um, our principal counsel, Ms. Borden, are going to participate in schools, um, go to all the middle schools in Prince George's County, every last one of them in Prince George's County, and to talk about the Constitution and specifically voting rights that day. So um, um, you just reminded me to say it that I failed to announce Constitution Day on September 17th. And thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate thank it. You. And Good we're luck. making sure that the Constitution applies to everybody now. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. Before. <laughs> yeah, initially. Thank you. Um, okay, item 3A. Chair and members of the planning board. For the record, Raina Hightower, Intergovernmental Affairs Coordinator. Today I'd like to quickly discuss with you CB 39 uh, 2019, which permits the development of RL zoned land with uses permitted uh, in 
the, in the LAC zone under certain circumstances. The bill is intended to facilitate a land transfer of two parcels between a commercial property owner and the Oak Creek Club HOA. The commercial owner uh, gets the RL uh, parcel to develop commercial uses and the HOA will receive the LAC property to develop uh, recreational uses. Uh, there's general support from uh, the property owners and the community on this bill, but staff had a few concerns about the process and the procedure that's used to do this. Uh, some of those concerns include this bill, CB 39 2019, amends the CDC uh, basic plan without going through the formal process, the formal amendment process, which could create unintended consequences. The proposed land transfer with this bill will allow commercial development on a residential low development uh, zone property, which fronts on Church Road, which is a historic road, uh, and is not a part of the approved basic plan. Newly permitted uses could conflict with existing regulatory approvals, and the uh, bill also permits the planning board to reevaluate setbacks on approved CDPs and SDPs, and staff noted that this does not change the ZMA conditions that are under the approved CDZ. Staff believes the appropriate process would be to amend the basic plans and revise the approved CDPs and SDPs uh, to reflect the, the revisions of the basic plan. Staff has recommended that the planning board vote to oppose CB 39 2019 at this time. Thank you. Questions? Something deja vu about this, but okay. <laughs> um, are there questions? Is there a motion? Except staff's recommendation oppose CB 39 2019. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Do you have uh, anything else? No, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hunt, is, uh -oh. there any, is there any other business to come before Planning Board today? That's all we have for today, Madam Chair. Planning Board is adjourned. <laughs>